Hello and welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rice Gallery's 2021 Biennial Juried Exhibition Do-It-Yourself Creative Writing Workshop with Hanif Abdurraqib. We'll hear first from Hanif, gather our materials, and work through the project step by step. You'll need to pause the video to read and work at your own pace. But first, I'll hand it to my esteemed colleague, Chiquita Mullins-Lee, to introduce our lauded poet and writer. Thank you, Kat, and lauded he is indeed. Uh, Hanif is from Columbus, Ohio, one of Columbus's own. We're proud about that. His poetry, essays, and music criticism have been widely published in places such as the New Yorker, the New York Times, and many others. His first full-length poetry collection, The Crown Ain't Worth Much, was released in June of 2016 from Button Poetry. His first collection of essays, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, was released in 2017 and was named a Book of the Year by BuzzFeed, Esquire, NPR, Oprah Magazine, the Los Angeles Review, and the Chicago Tribune, among others. Go Ahead in the Rain, Note to a Tribe Called Quest, was released in February of 2019 and became a New York Times bestseller finalist for the Kirkus Prize and was long listed for the National Book Award. His second collection of poems, A Fortune for Your Disaster, was released in 2019 by Tin House and won the 2020 Lenore Marshall Prize. And in 2021, he released the book, A Little Devil in America with Random House. He's a graduate of Beechcroft High School, Capital University. He's won an Ohio and a Book Award and he is a 2021 MacArthur Fellow. I will go on and say that this is a man who needs no introduction, but he certainly deserves one, Hanif Abdurraki. Thank you for the introduction and thank y'all for having me. I'm really excited to get to write with y'all. The plan that I have mapped out in my head is that um, I'm gonna talk for a bit about ekphrasis and ekphrastic writing or ekphrastic creation in general. And then I have three prompts based off of three pieces in the exhibition that I'm gonna share. I'm gonna share my screen and talk through the prompts. Um, and then each of them, I'm gonna give you about like 15 minutes to write uh, with the understanding that we're not kind, we're not really, I don't believe in the workshop as a place of completion or even complete production. I think of it as kind of an incubator for the idea that can become the thing later. Um, so much of the workshop spaces I encountered when I was young was so production driven, where it was kind of like, you need to leave here with something substantial. And the better question I have is wondering if what is actually substantial is leaving with a more efficient roadmap or a better plan for how to pursue work that might not be this work or might not have anything to do with this work, just to kind of um, a widening of the, the imaginary, the toolbox of the imagination, so to speak. And um, so that's kind of where my brain is at around the workshop. It is, is not necessarily completion, but of um, an exuberance around, around an idea. Starting with this thought that I often have about the practice of ekphrastic writing, which is of course, um, I mean, by like, dry definition, perhaps, writing based off of a piece of art, witnessing a piece of art, which is what we're going to be doing. But I'd like to kind of expand that notion and expand that idea a bit and push into uh, a realm where we kind of think about ekphrasis as a response to all witnessing or a response to the natural witnessing that we kind of just taken daily, right? Um, so much of my early writing, because I wrote so much about popular culture and because I wrote so much about kind of um, real time popular culture, I heard a lot about my writing that it wouldn't hold up in, in the future or that it wasn't, um, you know, that it was flimsier because it wasn't um, timeless, quote unquote, but, this is also, you know, the, 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 the least interesting question that to me is how do you get inspired or how do you know when you want to write about something? A better question that I begin to pose to myself and to others is um, 
what excites you um, about, um, you know, what excites you about the world and how do you easily and quickly identify what excites you about the world? And how do you respond to that excitement in the moment? Um, and so, you know, um, I, th I think that we have a real opportunity to kind of think about living as a pathway to ecrastic and, and enthusiastic writing, um, particularly now. And I, I'm not one of those like now more than ever kind of people, but I, I do think that my way of seeing and my way of um, experiencing has been both initially closed off, but now widened by the kind of stillness and stagnation of the world for me, which I know isn't the same for everyone, but I, I do feel like there's a stillness, you know, I don't leave my house often. You know, I went from leaving my house all the time to not leaving my house much at all. And so um, the visuals that I am confronted with, with consistency, have been kind of narrowed, which means that um, I've had to wrap my imagination around what happens when I look at something that I've looked at many times before and how can I ask myself better questions of what that thing I'm looking upon is doing? Not just art in my house, but also my dog, also the spatula in my kitchen, also a pair of sneakers that I love but cannot wear outside because I don't go outside a whole lot, you know? Um, the shrinking of, of my life, my needs, my desires, uh, has really, I think, opened up a kind of portal to that timelessness of writing about the same thing in new ways. That's one point. Another point is what I think is most useful about the idea of ekphrasis um, is that what you're actually writing about is maybe different than what's on the surface of what's happening. Right, and so the, 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 I'm always asking myself what I call the second question. There's a question after the after I take in something, there is a question that arises, or there is there is something obvious that I am immersed in, and um, there's often something behind that. Now, this is something that I think I arrived at due to the way that I was raised to listen to music, or the way that I was kind of put in positions to listen to music. For example, when I was young, I, I fell in love with the Beach Boys album, Pet Sounds, right? And that's an interesting album to fall in love with because it's an album of multiple questions being asked at once, sonic questions that have perhaps nothing to do with the a song's lyrical output, right? Uh, how do we match the inverted bass line to the drum track? How do we tie these sounds together? There's something underneath what is being presented to us. Um, and so that feels to me uh, like the question I'm always asking myself is, what am I writing about that is perhaps a little less obvious that points at something well, that, that guides people to something, but doesn't point at the direct thing. So I'm gonna jump into the first thing. This one was especially interesting to me today because I had to go to a hardware store, uh, much like this hardware store. And um, <laughs> it was, like an unexpected trip. And I remember being in there and being like, what's with all this stuff? Like, yes, this is a hardware store, but it's also like a grocery store kind of. And it's also like a corner store. There was, you know, I don't go, I don't, you know, I don't often go to hardware stores. Uh, and I was in there and I was like, why is there 
Why, why are they selling milk? Why is there like a candy shop in the corner? And so I was really excited about this piece particularly because it has some of those trappings too of like, you know, there are the Cheez-Its in the corner there um, underneath the WD-40 and then like Altoids. Uh, and it's all just kind of jumbled together. And these were the kind of stores I loved when I was a kid. You know, when I was a kid, there was a store on the east side called Anderson's. Um, and Anderson's was, was like this in a way where it was like, it was Target before, it was a smaller, more construct, constricted Target before I knew what Target was. You know, it was like Anderson's had tools and home improvement things and like candy and dairy, and dairy aisle. Um, and it was, it opened up this world of wonder for me. Um, and so for this, this is a photo that I wanted to start with because it is vast. It is um, immersive and it is asking a lot of our vision. But I would like us to hone in on one thing. And it is, um, I don't know if people can see my mouse moving, but it is this, I wanna hone in on the locks. I was drawn to this because when I first looked at this photo, I was thinking like, gosh, when was the last time I put like a combination lock on something? You know, it hasn't, I mean, truly, um, maybe college, maybe like my soccer locker, but I don't even think that. Um, and so the story here is the hardware store, but the piece I'm interested in reading or hearing or writing is a poem or short story or something about the last thing you put a lock on. Where the next thing, the thing that like really drew me or the first piece that really drew me during this exhibition was this piece, um, the sweeping meditation, because <laughs> um, when I was a kid, my parents, would sometimes like, you know, I, we didn't have enough money for me to get a consistent allowance, but I would sometimes do chores and the doing of those chores would earn me money. You know, it was one of those things I had to write out a contract. It was like a whole thing. And I never enjoyed sweeping because it felt to me like sweeping, one, I was never good at it. So this is why I believe sweeping is flawed because I'm bad at it, to be clear. There's a good way to sweep and clean, but I was not, I did not know it. Sweeping to me felt like such a pointless cleaning practice. It felt like um, the transferring of dirt from one place to another, and then a kind of um, a flawed practice of picking it up, particularly if you're doing it on your own, which I now do, right? In my house, I have like a handheld broom and a dustpan, and I always think I get it all. Then I go, then you go back, and there's that thin line of dirt still there because the dustpan cuts it. It's like a whole thing. And so sweeping, um, one of my least favorite chores and remains one of my least favorite chores, but I loved how fluorescent this piece made the work look, or not even the work, but just the, um, the tool of the work, the vessel for the way the work gets done. And this too felt to me like, um, a poetic practice, particularly because I find myself eager to and always seeking ways to ascribe something that feels beautiful or like beauty to things that I have otherwise found difficult or challenging or that I have been less than enthusiastic about. Um, some of this too is due to my, so much of my writing practice revolves around memory. And as I get older, or not even as I get older, just as I get more distant from a memory, um, it becomes blurrier in my recollection. Things become more blurry, things become more foggy. And so then a question for me becomes, um, how can I enhance 
the parts of this that are most beautiful and maybe discard the sharper edges of it. Not to say that all the memories I retain are good, certainly not true. But when I sit down to write, my first impulse is to lead with beauty and then ask some harder questions of that beauty after it arrives on the page. Um, you know, I am reading, um, it's, it's a book I normally have on my desk, but I'm reading a book now, I'm reading a memoir by the poet Carolyn Forche uh, that came out a few years ago, I think it came out in 2019. Um, and it's a memoir that's, that's just like deals with and traverses some really rough topics thematically and the, some of the imagery is really tough. Um, but because it's written in the voice and spirit of poetics, there's, there's a kind of beauty that overlays the difficulty. And that overlay does not negate the difficulty. It doesn't wipe the difficulty away, but it instead offers perhaps a softer entry point. Um, and so maybe that's why, that's a high level version of why I love this piece and why um, it just sent my mind going in a bunch of different directions. And it's just so immersive despite being a single meditation on a single object. And so the prompt here is not gonna be about brooms or about, uh, about anything too daunting, but so many of us have a single object or a single chore or a single vessel that uh, is somewhat displeasing, but we have to use it, right? Um, another thing I hated when I was a kid was nail clippers for some reason, right? The nail clipping, the sound of clipping nails really bothered me. That's not the case anymore, but when I was a kid, you know, even in my teenage years, I just hated nail clippers because the sound of cutting into the nail and the clipping, that little like metallic clack really bothered me. Uh, and so the nail clipper was a, was a tool that was necessary. It was a tool of necessity, uh, but not a tool that I enjoy. And so for this prompt, I would love for you to write uh, about a tool of necessity in your life. Again, can be as broad as you like that you do not love, but the work is to in your 16 lines or so, to render that tool beautiful, to afford that tool some beauty despite your distaste for it. Um, this, you know, I had, a, I had this project going that didn't make it into my last book of poems where I wrote like these little odes to things I didn't love. I had an ode to the nail clipper. Uh, it didn't come out well, but I tried really hard. Um, but, you know, this, this, consider this a chance to write an ode to the tool of necessity in your life that you do not love using, but that is a requirement for you to use. One thing that I am kind of uh, perpetually considering is that we are all like multiple, we hold multiple selves, right? Now, obviously this piece by Michael Coppedge is like different people. There are different people uh, throughout this series of photos, but um, the one thing that it drew me to think about was how many different people we each are, how many different people we all hold. This is something, and I don't want to relate everything to the pandemic, truly. Uh, that's the last thing I want to do. But there's been this kind of way, I, I, personally, I don't spend a lot of time looking in the mirror. I'm not like opposed to mirrors. I don't have like a phobia of mirrors. I just don't spend that much time. I, I have this whole theory about how it's um, pretty strange that we are confronted with uh, uh, an image of ourself uh, within any reflective surface, an image of ourself that almost um, undoubtedly doesn't always match the perception of ourselves in our head. It's pretty wild that we have to be confronted with that so consistently. Um, <laughs> my dog, Wendy, I, because my house is old, um, it has like the trappings of an old home. Uh, there is this thing called, there's a mirror in between the first and second flight of steps. You know, a wall of, of the, the entire walls a mirror. Um, there's a reason the person who like 
on my house before me told me a story about, you know, because the house is so old, that mirror exists because um, if someone were creeping up on you, you could see them. You know, it was a deterrent for people who might creep up on you, uh, which thankfully is not a problem I have at the moment, but who knows, the year is young. Um, but because it exists, my dog Wendy, when she goes to run down, almost every morning, when she goes to run down the stairs, she is, she gets to the bottom of the first thing there onto the landing and she's like confronted with, with her own reflection. And almost every morning she does this thing where she doesn't, you know, she stares for a little bit. She gets really close to it and doesn't bark or anything, but kind of just backs away, shakes herself off and runs away. And I feel like that is perhaps um, what my relationship with the mirror is too. But I also have a pretty like rigorous skincare routine. And so there are times in a day where I am in a mirror and that's just what it is. Um, I say all of this to say that it has been fascinating to notice these small changes. I, I've, I've noticed just because the world is slowing down and because my life is slowed down, I've noticed um, delightfully, not dreadfully to be clear, the like just small organic changes on my face as the as two years have passed. Um, and it's been interesting to, as someone who's not that much into looking at myself, to have this kind of confrontation um, and find it delightful. Now, when I talk about honoring the many cells we hold, I'm not talking about necessarily the physical self or the, um, the aesthetic self more the vastness of our emotional selves. But this piece uh, really made me think about reflections and mirrors and what, um, how generous I think our mirrors might be to us if they could speak to us instead of us speaking to them. Because I feel like sometimes at my least generous when I'm assessing myself. Um, and as so many of us know, if you're, if you're around people who love you or care for you, um, you know, the assessments of those in our orbit, the assessments of those who love us and care for us are often warmer and more thoughtful than anything we can lay upon ourselves. And um, so I wanted to end with this prompt because I loved where it took my head and, and hopefully it's, uh, not at all daunting, but and it, it is gonna it is gonna cause you hopefully no discomfort, but to embody the voice of not yourself speaking to yourself. So this prompt is to personify the mirror that you look into the most. And instead of you speaking to yourself, you know, or, or mumbling to yourself in the mirror, personify the mirror and be the mirror speaking back to you. And I have to really stress this in a complimentary way, right? I don't want any pieces that are like the mirror telling you how much, how awful you are. Think about the mirror as a place of a common relationship, a relationship that is, uh, that is well-worn by now. And so for this piece, Give me the voice of the mirror keeping praise upon you as you step into it, as you step in front of it for, let's say, the hundredth time. And it is thrilled to see you again. You haven't been there since yesterday, and it missed you a great deal. And here you are back again with some good news, and it has good news for you. Honey, these prompts have been great. I so appreciate you helping the collective us hold a mirror. To our participants, thank you again for joining us for the 2021 Biennial Juried Exhibition Do-It-Yourself Creative Writing Workshop. I'd like to give a special thank you to Hanif for his generosity of time and talents. If you'd like to see and learn more about Hanif, we have links to his Twitter and Instagram in the video description for you to click through. Thank you all. This has been great. And it you know, I, again, like I don't, I'm not around people much these days. And so to even have something like this to feel like um, 
we get to exchange and be in community together is a real, a real joy. So thank y'all for having me and thanks everyone for hanging out. And another round of thank yous to the governor's office, the Ohio legislature and the Ohio Arts Council's board who supports this great space.